Hey there YouTube, this is SJM4306 back with another video. This time I have some more goodies from uh, Handheld Legend. So it's actually really cool. Um, they're actually a local company to me and I've actually met um, Kyle and he's the CEO of Handheld Legend. And they're based in Willow Grove, which is like maybe not even a 15, 20 minute drive from where I am. So that's really cool. And I love supporting local businesses. And so my buddy, um, Dustin, he, um, he works for them. He asked me if I wanted to do another video. I've done a couple of videos in the past installing, um, some of their, their LCD mods or like IPS and TFT LCD mods, which are really super cool. So he asked me if I was interested in doing a mod for the Game Boy Pocket, because actually I have a number of, uh, Game Boy Pockets with dead LCDs or they have, uh, horizontal lines, which, you know, aren't really fixable very easily. I haven't at least been able to fix them. So I kind of want to do something with these boards. Uh, and I haven't been able to do anything until late when um, recently all these uh, IPS LCDs started popping up. So I've really wanted to play around with these. They're not cheap. They're 65 bucks. But if you have a Game Boy Pocket that's just literally doing nothing, sitting on a uh, shelf or in a... Um, sitting in a drawer, then definitely I think it's worth giving it a try. And I at least wanted to try this once myself. Now, he gave me actually a, a number of goodies. So he gave me the um, the IPS LCD kit, um, actually a little cheaper than that. I wonder if there's a sale. So it's 60 bucks right now. The Game Boy Pocket Shell, I opted for the um, kind of the semi-translucent glow-in-the-dark blue. So I'm really excited to see how this looks once fully assembled and in the dark. And I'm actually tempted to maybe change the LED. Maybe I'll put a UV LED or something and see if that makes the case kind of glow or something. We'll, we'll play around with that later. Uh, additionally, he sent me some clear buttons uh, to kind of go with the translucent, uh, translucent motif. Uh, additionally, I have the Clean Amp mod. It's a version 1.1. And actually, that works out perfectly because this, um, this pocket that I pulled doesn't have a speaker for some reason. I might have pulled it for another one, uh, fixing it for someone else. Uh, so I have a pocket without a speaker, so that works out awesomely. Uh, it includes its own speaker and this tiny little PCB. And uh, finally, there's a screen lens, a glass screen lens uh, for this. It The case itself comes with this uh, like plastic. I, I think it's some kind of plastic probably polycarbonate screen lens, um, but the glass ones are a major upgrade. So I think that's well worth the, the asking price, an extra five bucks. Now the clamp is about $15.50 and the shell, uh, including the buns, if you want to buy them, would be about what, like 17, 18 bucks. So the total is about $100 for everything I have on the, on the uh, screen right now. And we're going to actually go through this and install this. Now, I'm kind of excited to do the uh, LCD screen mod, but I kind of want to leave that to last. I want to do the um, speaker mod because um, once we install the LCD, there's a couple wires that have to go in between that and the board. Uh, so once we do the speaker mod, it'll be easy. It's kind of self-contained. So I guess uh, first step is let's take a look. At the packet provided now they nicely include a adhesive mount like a little sticker double-sided sticker to stick the speaker down and the amplifier board itself and I can barely see the uh, model number on the amp it's a little um, it's like a TQFN uh, no lead um, Looks like it has, what, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 pads on it. It's probably going to be a Class D amplifier, one of those like all-in-one amplifier chips. Now, there are two pads at the bottom here. If you short, they are like they look like resistor pads, but there's no resistor there. If you uh, short, there you go. If you short between, uh, like the top two gets a short and the bottom two gets a short to each other, then um, you can actually increase the loudness. I don't think I'm going to opt for that. I, I don't need a, a Game Boy that's like super loud, but I want to see just on the the um, the default configuration how loud this is. Even the default of this should be quite a bit louder than the, um, the original speaker on the Game Boy. So I'm going to leave it like this. And to actually do this mod, I think it'll be easier. We start out with uh, popping open this case. I'm just going to set this guy in here 
And actually, before I do that, let's um, tape the speaker down. So it should be just a matter of aligning this and try to do a good job, I guess. Doesn't have to be exact, but yeah, that's kind of more or less on there. Peel off the other side. And now this speaker is a tad smaller than the original. So there's going to be some wiggle room. I'm going to try to center it the best I can, though, which looks to be about that. And the position doesn't really matter because the wires are long enough and we're, we're just going to um, take some double-sided adhesive and actually stick this right on the back of the speaker right there. Okay, so I have some... 3M foam tape. So I'll take a little square of that. Wow, I pretty much got perfect size. <laughs> and stick this on the back here. Now, let's see. I'm going to follow the orientation on the um, the installation instructions on Handheld Legends website, and that's in this orientation right here, so that when you're looking at it, it's um, you know, the chips on the top, the capacitors in the lower uh, left there, and all the pads are kind of lined like a backwards L, and just stick that down roughly. Now. One thing is this kit does not include um, the wiring that you're going to need to do. So what I'm going to use is you can use pretty much any wiring, but it's a good idea to stick to very thin wire. So I'm going to use this 30 gauge, and you can see here, 30 gauge, a wire wrap wire. And this is um, like a Kynar type wire, uh, single core, and it has um, this insulation that you can melt off with your soldering iron tip or just cut off. And I'm going to use this guy uh, because it's it's pretty convenient. So give me one second. I'm going to heat up the iron and we'll get it going on this. Okay, iron's heated up. And I'm just going to actually remove the original speaker wires since we will no longer be needing them. To do that, just kind of grab hold and heat up on the other side. I'm going to do this while pulling. They should pop right out. Now we're not using the original amp, so we don't have to worry about having anything hooked up to these. Just make sure that this solder isn't shorting to anything nearby. And there we go. Good enough. Now I'm going to place this board back in, make sure the wires don't pinch or anything for the speaker. And tweezers will definitely help. And we are going to, I guess, the speaker wire should be soldered first. So, just going to tin the top two pads. Like that. And I don't think the orientation matters because the speaker, even though it is sort of polarized, it sort of isn't. So it's not really super important whether the black or the red goes on the top. For this case, for a stereo system, it would technically matter, but this isn't stereo, so, so I'm going to heat up and just solder the black wire to the top pad and the red wire to the one just below it. Make sure that the wires are kind of tucked under there. So, let's give you guys a little close-up so far. The speaker wires are done now. The middle pad, as far as I know, it's not connected to anything. And now we're going to need to start cutting wires. Now, we need to take from pin 5 of the headphone jack. They're actually numbered, luckily, which definitely helps. You can see it's label 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. 5 is actually the switch that tells 
your Game Boy if headphones are inserted so that it can play through the headphone jack instead of the speaker. So we need to grab that. And just looking at the Handheld Legend website, they have an image here and you can see pin five goes to the, the uh, second pad from the bottom of our amp chip. So let's just tin that so that we know where we're going. And we need to cut a small wire that'll just go that distance. So about yay long. And just heat up pin five. Now the other end just goes into that pad we just tinned. Made the wire a little longer than necessary, but no harm, no foul. Next up, there's actually um, on the DC-DC converter, there's, uh, let's see, the bottom pin and the top pin. There are three pins along the left-hand side, so one, two, three, and they're actually labeled four, five, six. So pins four and six are for power, and that's what's actually going to power the, the amplifier chip. Pin four, the bottom pin here, goes to the bottom pad of here. And pin six, which is the top pin on the DC-DC, will go to the leftmost pin here. So it's these two pins. Now we have one wire left to solder and it's the longest. So just double checking. Now, one slight criticism is I would actually suggest just for the installation images if they use color-coded wires, so black for ground, red for positive, because it's hard to see when the wires cross. You have to be really careful. It looks like this long wire, oops, looks like the long wire might go to the leftmost pad, but it's not. It's actually crossing over and going to the middle pad there. So anyway, that middle pad has to go all the way up here to the middle pad on the volume control, and that allows it to obviously control the volume. So we are going to take this wire, and it's gonna route, give myself enough room, enough slack on the wire, about there. And we're gonna start at the bottom, the middle pin on the bottom. Just tin that. And that does, they thread it through. There's like a little support arm on the cart slot. They actually thread it through that just to keep it down so it doesn't get pinched. And it goes like that. And I'm actually going to, before I solder that, just add a little tiny bit of solder to the middle pin that we're going to solder it to on the volume control. And that's just to, to tin it with some fresh solder to make sure that it takes. Solder doesn't flow very well. It's like maybe yours is corroded. It might help to put a tiny dab of like flux from like something like a flux pen, like this guy. And it should flow perfectly then. And we're just going to insert it and kind of flatten it so it doesn't get in the way of the uh, cart contacts or anything like that. And there we go, that should be done. Let's uh, turn the volume all the way up and switch it on. This is all the way. And it's uh, quite loud. <laughs> but yeah, you can definitely hear some hum. But it is super loud. Oops. Okay, yeah, so I think I might actually have to go through and replace the capacitors in this because you heard it just browned out and reset at full volume. The speaker enough was uh, enough to brown out the Game Boy. Or it could be my batteries are kind of dead. But yeah, at like a reasonable volume. That's as loud as she goes. And let's put a little quieter. I can hear, at the speaker on the lowest volume, I can hear a little bit of hum. Hopefully you can hear. Let's see. 
I'm not sure if you could hear that, but it is a little bit audible, and I think that might have to do with, I probably do need to swap the caps on here. So yeah, neighbors will have absolutely no problems hearing me play Pokemon from now on. So we're just going to pull this out. Set everything aside there. So yeah, next uh, we're actually going to be installing the IPS LCD. Okay, what do we got in the LCD kit? A whole bunch of goodies. There we go. So we have some double stick adhesive tape to stick the LCD to the front shell, the LCD itself, and the ribbon. And the ribbon actually comes with, there's two extra wires you, you will need to solder to the main board, and this kit does come with the wires, which is really nice. So let's just take a look. The LCD. Now these LCDs are like super thin and they are a bit fragile. So you don't want to apply pressure or flex the frame because you can easily crack these LCDs. First step, just need to remove the protective film and only touch the screen from this point on by the edges. Just so you don't get any gunk on. Okay, to make my life easier, I actually carefully peeled off the speaker. It's not stuck on there like super well. So I was able to luckily pull that off because for the IPS mod, you actually, I forgot, need to cut uh, some of the plastic supports for the LCD. And that would have been impossible trying to keep the original PCB tethered and angle. And, no. So if you guys are going to do the same thing like me and install both the CleanAmp mod and the IPS, probably actually easier to do the IPS first and then do the CleanAmp mod or um, just don't tape down the speaker when you do the clean amp mod. So I'm just gonna set this aside and we're gonna look at what we need to cut exactly on this shell. So it looks like we're gonna need to cut like most of these supports away. There's two little bits near the screw post that need to go as well. And they show you, let's see. Yeah, they show you the exact little bits. They stick out a little bit, and the original purpose is to put pressure on the LCD and force it to the right-hand side just a little bit. And But those actually will get in the way of installing the, the LCD there. As you can see, the LCD goes right up against kind of where the screw posts are. So what we are going to do is what they suggested, just use a pair of um, flush cutters and cut pretty much everything away. So yeah, this is going to take a little while. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, just pieces flinging off, that's great. Um, so yeah, wear, wear some protective goggles. I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this whole thing on camera safely while being able to see what I'm doing and also trying to keep everything in shot. So I removed just a little bit here. I'm gonna do the whole rest off camera, so give me one second. Okay, so I cut everything down with some flush cutters and try to get it as flat as possible. It's actually kind of a bit harder to do. Um, an X-Acto blade might help actually uh, flatten it a little bit more. Some parts were kind of hard to get depending on how it was angled. And I cut these, the little tabs that were on here. Uh, this shell is an aftermarket shell, obviously, so the uh, placement of the tabs were a little bit different than the stock photos that they showed. Uh, but I try to do my best to do that. And obviously it leaves kind of this scarred um, cut plastic look so that will mostly be covered by the shell with the exception you can see a tiny little bit in the corner there now they do claim that if you do want to use double-sided tape which I don't know I'm thinking maybe that might be a good idea thinking maybe it might not but um, it will show it's uh, black in color it will show on this hand side so if you don't want to uh, to actually have it all visible you actually do want to cut uh, just a bit. I think to be safe, um, I will use this just to demonstrate how you would. But I think a slightly better idea would be maybe um, just some kind of weak double double stick tape. Um, something that's not as strong as this 3M. So if you did want to remove it, you could. But anyway, I'm just going to go through here and just kind of cut just want to expose the part that will be left behind. Uh, 
And the other thing that this will do is it'll provide a little bit of cushion if you didn't cut perfectly um, flat and there's some raised bits. It'll prevent that from digging into the LCD when you close it up. It'll provide some cushion so that you minimize the risk of possibly cracking the LCD, which will be worst case scenario. And we should be able to just kind of... Yeah, just pop that out center part i like to save them uh, just so i have extra bits of double adhesive foam i can use for other projects the cable on the bottom has to be going towards the left and you want to push this front corner the top corner as far up as you can go i think the yeah the power led indicator you might need to trim a little more off that so i'm just going to go in here and here, flatter in that area. So the same thing. And now it fits. You can see it just fits like perfectly. And always, this is exposed now. Um, keep it on a clean, flat surface. I suggest using the baggie that it came in. Okay. So this is what some people affectionately call Lego style connector. Uh, it's basically a snap fit Molex. This will only go in uh, when it's correctly aligned and don't crush the connector, but it should snap similar to how a Lego snaps. And if it's not going in right, don't force it, check the alignment and retry it. There you go. I just heard it snap. And I would suggest doing that um, not before you stick this down. Don't press down like this while it's on top of the LCD. Uh, support it from both sides and snap it that way. Um, much less risk of cracking the LCD if you do it that way. So anyway, um, now is actually a good time to install all the buttons and the membranes, which I cleaned because they were quite dirty. And these screws are not the original ones. They're the ones that came with the shell. Just want to be careful. Get a small enough screwdriver that you don't strip out the heads and don't do them too tightly because that's another beginner mistake. Um, what these screws are actually doing is they're tapping the threads into the plastic for the first time. So just kind of go slow and don't over tighten them. And you won't have a problem then. Just double check at this point and all the buttons feel good. Now, let's see, how am I gonna, what do, <laughs> they give you this little piece of metal and no adhesive or anything on it. And I don't know if this will take to solder. And at this point we can uh, insert the ribbon. Want to insert it till just the top of the contacts are visible. Lock the tilting tabs. I think what I'm gonna do is actually unscrew this and put a thin piece of plastic in between the two sides uh, because it looks like there is a possibility of shorting um, to the front of the pocket PCB to the ribbon cable adapter. So actually a good job for this is the original protective film that it came with. <laughs> Just kind of stick that over the whole exposed contact area there that it should protect from anything shorting because there are some contacts here and it's not thick enough that it, it'll it cause issues with the case closing hopefully. <laughs> There's two points that we need to solder on the ribbon itself on the top side. And these, you don't want to have your iron on very hot and you don't want to leave it on there long because this um, ribbon material can delaminate pretty easily. So just kind of touch and go. And that's it. Just going to put a little silicone down so I don't melt my pad when I try to tin this. So hopefully solder takes to this. Yes, it does. Good. So I'm going to solder one end of the second wire to here. 
And the other end will go to the other end of the ribbon. Like that. Now this other wire near the power switch actually has to go to pin one of the power switch. Other end of the wire there, and it just goes right on to pin one. Just tuck that wire out of the way. Should be all the soldering we need to do. They show the touch sensor going into this corner here, um, but I might actually just kind of put it sideways on the top. So I came across an interesting problem. The original contact, it seems like the positive side doesn't stick out enough because when I tried this with the original back, this guy, it worked perfectly. And when I switched to this new back, I couldn't get it to power on no matter how much I swiveled the batteries. And I found if I put something metal in between and shorted uh, the positive contact of the bottom battery to the metal, it worked. So I actually took out one of the contacts from, I have a couple spares from other Game Boy Pockets that I repaired. And I stuck it in here and it works. So you might have to pull the uh, contact from your a spare Game Boy Pocket. But yeah, as you can see here, uh, let's see volumes on here. The speaker mod still works. And color, all the uh, color palettes. Let me just turn that down. It's a bit too loud actually for my taste. But yeah, you can see this all works. And if you press and hold, I believe you can get it to turn off Yeah, there you go. You can see um, there were like grid lines you can see between most older LCDs. You can actually press and hold this for a while and toggle that on and off. I actually really like the look of those like scan line sort of things going on. So um, I think it's called screen door effect. But I actually really like that so I will probably stick with it. And they even have an inverted mode. That's interesting. Anyway, um, so everything works. So now it's just a matter of screwing it all back together. I was kind of on the fence. Maybe I will eventually replace the LED uh, with another color, but I think for the time being, I'm, I'm fine with it sticking with the red. We will need to stick some double-sided tape onto the touch sensor and then stick it somewhere on the case. So I'm going to stick it on the top corner here so that when you tap the corner, that's where the touch sensor is. That'll be its home. And make sure you get the power switch in there and it's in the right position. Kind of in the center. Oh, these are actually uh, Phillips as well. So I guess no try wing necessary. If you are using the original case screws, uh, those will be obviously try wing. Just go slow and don't over tighten. Okay, and what's pretty much the final step? Just some compressed air. Um, and like I said, I probably need to clean the, um, the potentiometers, put some isopropyl alcohol. I've noticed, um, the contrast controls the volume or the, the screen brightness, obviously. And I've noticed, uh, it sometimes will flicker. And I think it's because there's some grime in there, but yeah, I need to work this back and forth and clean it. But yeah, you could see it does sometimes lag a little bit. But yeah, you can control it. This is the minimum brightness, which is still actually much more visible than the original LCD. And max brightness. Bam.
So yeah, something like that is, I think, a pretty good level. So yeah, overall, I'm actually pretty happy with this. <laughs> the volume, um, the like new speaker and the um, the clean amp mod, it's actually a huge upgrade. I wasn't actually really uh, worried before about adding an upgrade for the speaker. I usually actually keep audio off and use headphones. Uh, so that's not that big deal for me, but for a lot of people, I think that would be a huge upgrade. The screen itself is is a massive upgrade in terms of um, clarity, and you just you get tons. I haven't counted, but it looks like maybe fifteen or twenty uh, different uh, like color modes. The brightness working off the contrast wheel is awesome, so um, you can adjust the brightness uh, without having to cycle through different functions with the uh, touchpad. And yeah, everything works so far. From reports I've seen, uh, we'll actually do a measurement right now, actually. But um, battery life on this might be somewhere around the neighborhood of maybe... I've heard anywhere from like three to four hours. So you're cutting the battery life in less than half of a stock Game Boy Pocket. I think the a stock Game Boy Pocket last I measured was it would pull around maybe 100 milliamps. So I put it on the 10 amp range. And there we go. About 260. And we'll just go to the title screen and see if it increases or not. Okay, as we saw at full volume, it was peaking at around 500 milliamps and um, just sort of medium volume, anywhere from 280, well, about 260 to 300 milliamps. Now off of a standard set of um, AAA batteries, I think those will net you about 1000 milliamp hours. So anywhere from about two hours to yeah about three hours i think that's pretty much in line with um tests that other people have done so brightness on the lowest it'll go let's see if that gives an improvement okay so it looks like on the lowest brightness and kind of low volume we're hitting about 200 milliamps so if i just let's see Lower the volume just a bit. Yeah, so we're hitting about maybe 200, 220 milliamps. So that's maybe about five hours on the lowest brightness. And obviously we crank that brightness up. And even at low volume, we're hitting about 400, just under 400. Sorry about that. Realize you can't see the multimeter there. But yeah, about 400-ish then. So actually not too bad in terms of the current draw. So you. you you should be able to expect, depending on both volume and brightness, anywhere from two hours to uh, five hours of battery life-ish. But yeah, not bad. And the screen looks really nice too. Definitely a worthy upgrade. Um, at the price point that this is at currently, so about 60 bucks, um, I would say if you have a pocket with a broken LCD, you're pretty much not going to be able to find an original LCD uh, by this point, unless if you buy another broken pocket with a working LCD. Chances of doing that now are not very cheap anymore. Um, you used to be able to get broken pockets for like under 20 bucks. Now they're like 30 plus. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's kind of unfortunate, but I think for 60 bucks, this is definitely worth it if you game a lot and your pocket is like the main console that you use. Uh, definitely really nice looking. Can get you right up close there. There we go. You can see that screen door effect. I love it. That was one of my holdouts on these uh, LCD displays. Some um, aftermarket displays don't have the screen door effect, and it just looks super crisp. You know, no pixel separation though. And some people like that. I actually like this screen door effect from the original LCD. And so them bringing that over as a feature throughout the entire palette, I think makes this a lot more desirable to me. So definitely happy that they decided to do that. 
And yeah, overall, um, installation was not bad. Um, other than cutting uh, plastic out was a bit of a pain. Uh, definitely not particularly difficult. I think if I had to do this again, though, I wouldn't use a double-sided tape on the LCD so that I could pull out the LCD if I ever wanted to. Uh, because I have a feeling it's going to be a bit of a pain uh, if I ever need to get in there to, to do anything. Like if dust ever somehow gets in, that might be a pain to get out. Uh, I probably will end up putting some black tape here. Uh, it's just looks a little bit, sticks out a little bit having that light bleed in there. Uh, but other than that, yeah, super happy with this. Uh, huge thanks to um, Kyle and Dustin from Handheld Legend um, for sending uh, both the clean amp the shell and the IPS LCD in for uh, installation. And overall, between the two of them, it took me about, I want to say, an hour and a half. Uh, a little longer because I was futzing around with the camera. Uh, but if I didn't have a camera in front of me and I just had some uh, music on in the background and I was just doing this at a relaxed pace, I would expect this to maybe take about half an hour to 40 minutes per mod. If you guys are interested, uh, links will be down below uh, to the the product pages for everything used in this mod. And if you are interested in refurbing pockets, definitely give this a look if it's within your price range, because I think the performance is definitely worth it. It's just, you have to ask yourself if you use your pocket enough to justify the cost. Um, they do also have similar mods for other consoles. Um, for instance, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, and Game Boy Advance SP. So you can always choose which uh, console you like the best that you think you'll use the most and do the LCD mod just for that console. Just a very quick addendum. I've noticed um, if I if there's a full screen transition, uh, this is probably the video converter ribbon that's doing this. You'll notice when I transition, you'll see some uh, kind of lines flashing at the top of the screen. And I think that has to do with maybe the syncing or the frame buffer of the uh, the chip that's converting the signal between the Game Boy Pocket on that's on the ribbon cable and the T, uh, the IPS LCD. And it's it's a little bit glitchiness. So don't expect this LCD to act 100% exactly like the original screen would. That would not be there on the screen. And I have noticed in certain cases there are if this isn't really the game to show this, but uh, there will be a little bit of um, screen tearing uh, every once in a while, you'll notice. It's nothing that's so distracting to me that um, I can't use the screen, but if you are a perfectionist, uh, just you know keep that in mind that this isn't a 100% uh, one-to-one copy of like the original LCD and all the functionality. So you are going to notice a little bit of kind of every once in a while momentary gra uh, graphical glitches. So yeah, anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one. Bye.